Born in Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 51. Again, we've been talking about for the last few weeks. This is the account of Jesus. Last moments. On the cross. The last moments where he had physical life in, within the body. Everything that led up to it, he was falsely tried. He was unjustly tried. Falsely convicted. He was persecuted. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was, he was abused. And he endured all of this. He endured all of this. Because that was part of God's plan of salvation for our lives. That was the ultimate plan. Because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. Way back in the Garden. Genesis chapter 1. God wasn't surprised by what happened in the garden. We read that God created the world, the earth, then the stars and the sky and the moon and, and the whole creation account. And on the sixth day, he created man. We read all of that. But see, to us, with our, with our minds, the way we do things, we think, whoa, okay, that's it. Everything's here. Earth is created. Adam and Eve are in place. That was God's plan. That wasn't God's plan. That wasn't the finish. That wasn't the ultimate. That wasn't the purpose for the plan. See, we're, that's, 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 that's not how we operate. That's not how we think. <laughs> when I was a kid, I had some gerbils. And we had the male and the female. We had a little tiny cage and everything. And that was the plan for me to have two gerbils. I didn't anticipate reproduction. Ooh. Multiplication. I didn't anticipate all of that. I didn't think about all of that. So, there and there, it's been about a week and it's all good. I'm feeding them and everything. I got a I mean, they weren't cramped in there. There was enough room for two. They had food. They had a little water thing. And then come back about a week later, I was like, whoa, hey. There's more than two in there. I didn't, didn't plan for that. I went and bought them with my allowance. I had my money. Had enough for two gerbils. Had enough for the little thing. It was the habit trail that you could add on to and everything. I wasn't planning for all of that. So instead of having to spend my money, because I didn't, I didn't have it anymore. <laughs> it all went to the gerbils and the cage and the food and all the stuff. I didn't, I didn't plan. So what I did is I went out in the backyard and I, I built a cage, a big old, big old cage. Okay, about bang, bang, like bang like that, so I could fit all kind of animals in there, little gerbils and everything. So I took, took, took everybody out of the little plastic thing because it's not good enough anymore. Put everybody in the big old thing, and they they raised and everything, and it was it was all good for a little while. But oh god, it, then, there, then there was more. <laughs> Talk about a plan going bad. Couldn't sell them, couldn't give them away. I just had all these gerbils now. So next allowance, I had to go buy some more, add to the habit trail, the plastic and all of that, and it's in my room, and it's going all over the place now, and and everybody's running around, and everybody's all good and happy. Younger brothers. Younger brothers. See, I'll tell you what I know about younger brothers. Amen. They shall remain nameless. Go into the room, mess around with the habit trail, knock a piece loose, don't put it back. Now I got gerbils all over my room. <laughs> Again, a plan gone bad. So I didn't have a contingency, so what I did was. Uh, I found a way to give them all away. Ended up, I got rid of all of them because I'm tired of all of this. I wanted to, and they just, they just ruined it all with that whole multiplication thing. That wasn't the plan, so I got rid of everybody. Like, everything's gone. 
got I, I just gave it away. I gave it away. I have a trail, all of that. Person I gave it to was all impressed. Oh man, this is so nice. You just give it away. Yeah, just just give it away. <laughs> just give it away. I tried to throw in the homemade cage and everything. He's like, no, no, man, no. That's kind of rough looking. I'll just get some more habit trail stuff. You know, I took the cage out in the back and destroyed it. But see, that was my plan. My ultimate plan was to have two, and that was it. But see, God is so much more <laughs> intelligent than I am. So much more foreseeing than I am. It's not a light thing to say that he is omniscient, all-knowing. He knows what's going to happen. When God made Adam and Eve in the garden, that was not the finished plan. That was not the final draft. The final draft would, would, would be purified and processed through Christ's crucifixion. And then it would be culminated at Pentecost when he poured out his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit filled. That was the ultimate plan. But it had to go through the stages. It had to go through the stages. I terminated my plan after stage three. Terminate. It's done. I'm tired. Well, one of the things, uh, the, the cage was collapsing and everything. These gerbils are up there. They're, they're, the gerbil is way up here. And I put my hand up so the gerbil wouldn't fall. It bit me. <laughs> I moved my hand and that thing plummeted. I'm like, that's what you get. How did that benefit me? Now I gotta chase this thing all around the floor. See, my plan. My plan. Not thought out all the way through. Not thought out all the way through. God's plan completed from the beginning. Completed from the beginning. You see. If I thought through all of the stuff that was going to happen with these gerbils, if I had thought it through to the end, buying a male and a female, really? No, man. If I had thought that through, then I would have got to that point where, like, you know what? I'm going to need, and I would have been better prepared. Knowing that I'm going to have to go through all of these stages, I would have been better prepared. But because I wasn't better prepared, because I wasn't ready for everything that was going to happen, termination. I've got to go. But see, God knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that when he created Adam and Eve, he knew that he had an enemy that was going to try to drive a wedge. He knew that that enemy knew that he had to get the first two. He knew that. And he knew that the enemy would come in. He knew that Eve would be deceived. He knew that Adam would sin. He knew all of that. But he also knew that in his appointed time, he would send Jesus to die on the cross to clean all of that up. See, even at my most intelligent, I wouldn't have been able to think of a plan to clean all of that up with all these germs. My plan was extinction. Get rid of them all. They no longer exist to me. You are dead to me. God didn't do that with us because he already knew what was going to happen. He wasn't surprised. He put him in the garden with full knowledge of what we as a people would put him through. I said, we as a people, I mean mankind. From Adam all the way up to Jesus. He knew what we were going to go through. He knew that he would choose out a select few. He knew that they would cry out to him. He knew that they would worship him. He knew that they would also turn their back on him and worship other gods. He knew all of that. He knew that it would happen over and over and over and over again. He knew that it was going to happen. Knowing that it was going to happen didn't hurt any less. But God knew that I'm not going to destroy it. I'm going to redeem them. I had no plan of redemption for those gerbils. In my mind, they could not redeem themselves, especially the other one that bit me. What? I don't have a recipe for gerbils. <laughs> but God had a plan. He knew. He already had a plan to, 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 to get us into relationship. He created us so that we could have a relationship with him. And for as good as it was with Adam and Eve, that wasn't the end. Because God could have prevented any of that from happening. He could have prevented it. He could have, he could have locked the devil out. He could have never planted the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
tree of life. He could have never planted those. He could have just put them in the garden, went down there and hung out with them. They could have multiplied and, and, and as he commanded and there would, and there would have been, but where's the free will in that? Where's the free will? Where's the choice in that? Now, all he has literally is a bunch of sheep that he is the shepherd of going down and visiting them. Almost like pets, if you will. Almost like pets. But that wasn't enough for God. He created him, hung out with him, let him get a taste of who he was. Yeah, it's just it's that taste, that, that fellowship. Just for the enemy to come in, drive that wedge. But see, God knew that every single thing, every single step of this was going to happen, and he was willing to go through to get to the end of his plan. When we plan things, we don't plan for it. We don't anticipate hardships. We know that they can come, and we try to have a backup plan. If we plan a road trip, we want to make sure the tire, spare tire has air. We want to make sure we got extra food. We want to make sure we got water. We want to make sure we, we, we try to make, and make sure everything is good. We make sure we got roadside assistance. Can't we, can't we run out of gas? We try to make sure everything, but we would prefer not to have to experience any of that. God knew that there would be bumps, glitches, failures on our part. He knew all of that, and he was still willing to go through all of that so that he could have a relationship with us. <clears throat> he was willing to go through all of that to get us to where we are now. To where we can declare that we will live from the inside out. But that had to be a plan. Intimate, personal interaction with God, our Father, is what we have now. But how did we get here? I'm glad you asked. Hmm. As we read in our scripture, Jesus is on the cross and he cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? At that point, he had taken on the sin of the world. The sin of the world. Every sin that would be committed from Adam Eve until he comes back, until Jesus returns as king, every sin is covered. But when he took on every sin and his shed blood washed it all away Jesus. and he cried out Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? Because the father, the God who endured the pain over all these generations the father who endured the pain of separation from his creation as Jesus took all of those sins upon himself, God could not look at him. Because of just the sin of the disobedience of his command of taking a fruit and, and eating of it. Caused that separation between God and man. How? He didn't even turn his back on man then. He still went down in the midst of Adam and Eve. And provided a means by which he could still have a level of interaction with them. That's from one, one disobedience. Christ himself, the innocent, the unsin, the perfect, the complete. When he takes on the, the son of God himself, when he takes on every sin in creation, takes it on himself. God can't look upon him in that moment. Jesus knew this was coming. He knew it was coming. He even said, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But in the end, nonetheless, not my will, but thine be not. And in doing so, taking that the sin of the world upon himself, and the veil was rent. 
He took all that sin. He says, Eli, 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 lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then they went and got the sponge with the vinegar wine on it, wine vinegar. And they said, he even wait, wait, wait. He's calling Elias. Let's see if Elias will save him. At the height of the crucifixion, experience still being mocked, still being. At this point, he can't come off the cross. And if he does, he there's no hope for mankind. There's no hope for mankind. But still being mocked, still being ridiculed, stayed on the cross. And he cried with a loud voice. And with that cry of the loud voice, You ever seen those videos of guys in the weight room lifting big heavy weights? It's funny when you watch them. But the guy, you see, I mean, he's got the bar, there's like eight plates over here, eight plates on each side, and that's a lot of weight. It's more funny when the guy lifts it and there's only one plate on each side. And he's acting like he's lifting the same thing that guy was lifting over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doesn't mean quite the same thing. Christ, in that moment, taking on every sin from Adam until his own triumphant return, taking on that, cried out with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. In that moment, he became the veil. Every sin was washed away. The condition of sin that mankind was in that kept us in perpetual separation from God. When the veil was rent, the condition of sin, the power of sin to condemn man and keep us permanently separated from God. And Jesus gave up that loud cry and the veil was rent. The power of sin to keep us permanently separated from God was wiped away. When the veil tore, the power of sin to keep us separated from God was wiped away. But we have to, we have to receive Christ in order to step into that power. The power of his shed blood. We were protected by the blood of animals, but we're redeemed by the blood of Christ. We're redeemed by the blood of Christ. We can't be snatched out of his hands. When the veil was rent, remember the veil, what it represented. On God's side, he saw the blood of the animals. On our side, we saw protection. We saw prevention. We saw sin that kept us from going into the presence of God. Jesus knew both sides of the veil. Jesus became the veil, and the veil was rent. Appropriate because his body was, <laughs> was abused. And as he gave up the ghost, the veil was rent. So remember the veil. It represented the place where the, the, the mercy seat of God rested. Where only the high priest could go in. Only after he had been ceremonially cleaned. Washed by the water. The water. To where now we are all washed by the living water. And can now enter into the presence of God. But the mercy seat where God rested, the, the gold top of the Ark of the Covenant, where there were two angels facing each other on the seat, and they're on their knees, and their hands are down, bowed in worship, and their wings are facing each other, and God's glory would come down and rest in between those two angels, and God would minister unto the high priest to give word to the people. And it's called the mercy seat, simply because in the midst of a sinful people, sinful Sinful condition 
in the midst of a sinful people. The God who can't be in the presence of sin sought audience with them and pre provided a means by which he could come down and be in their presence without having to destroy them. And he came down and rested on the mercy seat. And it's called the mercy seat simply because he chose in his inhabitation of the mercy seat to minister to the people, to speak what was needed to the people. Encouragement, rebuke, instruction. The word of God is useful in teaching, rebuking, instructing, and training in righteousness. God did all of those things from the mercy seat. Rather than destroy the people. He instructed, he taught, he rebuked, he corrected, and he instructed, he trained in righteousness. He did all of that from the mercy seat. But when the veil was torn, but when the veil was torn, when Christ gave up that loud cry and gave up the ghost, the veil was torn. And what's the significance of the veil being torn? Now we have access. To the God that used to abide behind the veil. I feel like I should be singing Daryl Coley's song, Beyond the Veil, because <laughs> that's one of my favorites. But I, because that's that's where that's where we stand right now as believers. Beyond the veil, but it's not a it's not. We're not beyond the veil as the high priest was. We are beyond. We are beyond the veil, beyond the rent and separated veil, in the presence of the holy and one true God. We have access to because of as believers because of the blood. For as much as God allowed his presence to be contained where the mercy seat was, within the bounds of the veil, when the veil was rent, we were given access to the living God. I imagine that as the veil was being rent, just the, the presence of God pouring out. The presence of God pouring out. Picture, if you will, what it would be like if the Hoover Dam busted. What would happen to the area immediately? It would be flooded. Flooded in a devastating manner. But in the spirit realm, in the spirit realm, where when that veil was rent, God's presence just poured out. And oh, came out in overflowing, in, 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 in excessive manner. So now we have access. We have access. <clears throat> we went from limited access by means of periodic bloodshed to now constant access because of a one-time shedding of blood. We went from having to make the sacrifice in order that God could maintain a level of of interaction with us. We went from that as people to now worshiping him because we have that relationship with him. And again, and again, that relationship requires, requires that we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives. That we believe Without Jesus, we are sinners. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That we are sinners. You have to acknowledge that before God. By the same token, <clears throat> if a child comes to the parent <laughs> having stolen a donut, Powder donut. <laughs> you come before your parent, just powder all around your mouth, still on your fingers. Um, can I can I go to the movies? Did you have a donut? No. No, I, I didn't have a donut. Powder? 
just all all up in here. You still got it on your hands, crumbs down your front. You know, can I go to the movies? Did you did you take a donut? No, no. I didn't I didn't have no donut. I didn't have no donut. What's that on your mouth? I don't know. I don't know how that got there. I what had happened was you, I was um in the laundry room and the, the dish, the stuff it spilled on me because I was sweating in those areas and it stuck like right there. And so I tried to wipe it off with my hands and it stuck to my hands too. That's what we look like before God. Trying to come to him without having acknowledged our sin. You're covered with powdered donut. You got to come before the Lord and say, I know I've sinned before. I know I've sinned against you. But when you come to God, say, I know I've sinned against you, but I want to have a relationship with you. So I accept Jesus as Lord of my life because I know that he died for my sins. He died so that I could have a relationship with you. We have to come before him and say, I acknowledge Jesus as Lord of my life. And when you call Jesus Lord of your life, that means that every decision you make now is based on the fact that you have accepted Jesus as Lord of your life. That means that everything you do with your life, everything you do with your computer, everything you do with your car, everything you do with your phone, everything you do with your self, everything you do with your mind, everything you do with your attitude, you do it based on the fact that I'm a child of God now. I'm a child of God. If you acknowledge your sins, you confess that sin before God, you believe that Jesus died for you so that you could have a relationship with God, washing away the sin that separated you from God, you receive him as Lord and Savior of your life. You are now a child of God. You are now in full access of the Father. Amen. Amen. Now, you have access to everything because the veil was rent so that you can now have full access to the Father. That's the same thing as driving out to the wet and wild water park. You never bought a ticket. But you're at the gate telling them, you know what, I need to get in. I need to get in. And they're like, I'm sure you do. <laughs> no, I, I, I really, I really, I, I love water. I love this water park. You're like, you know what? That's cool. Good. Good. I'm glad you do. And we like you too. Well, can I get in? Can I ride the ride? Did you buy a ticket? No. Sorry. Sorry for you. And they'll probably tell you, you know what, if you go over to Aliante Park, the Dinosaur Park, they got those little water things that shoot up out of the ground. You can go run through those, okay, um, have fun, get off my property. But when you show up with a ticket in hand, when you show up with a ticket in hand, showing that you paid, showing that you say, you know what, I, I, I really want to get inside of here and take advantage of these rides. And get some of this refreshment. And get some of this relief from the Las Vegas heat. Jesus is our ticket to God. Jesus is our ticket to God. But unlike wet and wild, the closes at the end of the day. The closes for the winter time. God doesn't close. God doesn't close. He's 24-7. He's full access. He's full service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everything we need, we can have because the veil was rent. Everything we need, whatever we need, we can have because the veil was rent. So much access, so much. Now, if God were wet and wild, we can run and go in there and ride on every ride. Every ride that we're tall enough to be on. Amen? Because yeah. <laughs> God's not going to let us run out and do things that we, we can't handle. But 
we have full access to God. What it is we have right now was the way God planned it from the beginning. This is not plan B. The Holy Spirit indwelling us is not plan B. It's plan A. It's plan A. It's plan A, it's plan a of God's well-written action movie. The well-written action movie. I got a friend at work, he watches the, the series Arrow. He tells me about it. I think I've seen a couple of episodes, but on that show, nobody seems to die. <laughs> the only one person has, has, has died on the show. But when they show all the flashbacks and this person is, is inside the plane and it's burning and they're and they're leaving the island, okay, that was like 10 years ago, five years ago, or whatever. And so now he's all up in this action. And that person that it were in the plane burning up and it blew up and everything, he comes out and there's that person right there in front of him. He, he just didn't die. Wow. You So you didn't die in the plane? Ah, you should have stayed. I was able to pull myself out and rescue myself, and now I have revenge against you. And he just never died. I don't think that's well written. Nobody dies. Really? Come on now. But God's well written, well written action story <laughs> involves us. He's the main character. We're supporting actors. Jesus is the hero. We're the ones in distress. We're the ones in need of saving. The devil is the enemy. Trying to keep us from getting to God. Trying to destroy us so that we can't spend eternity with the Father. But, but, the hero named Jesus, he came down. <laughs> he came down, he was born as a baby. <laughs> he lived his life. And at the end of that life, he was crucified. And the enemy thought he had him. The enemy was doing his worst. He was doing everything. You know what? Let's 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 first falsely try him, unjustly try him. While we're doing that, you know, drive a crown of thorns on his head. We have people punching him. We have people slapping him, pulling on his beard, spitting on him. Yes, spitting on him, nasty. But but you know, and then we'll put him on the cross. While he's on the cross, people are going to make fun of him. People are going to mock him. While he's on the cross, somebody will come up and stab him in his side. And when Jesus gave up the ghost, what the enemy thought was his moment of victory was actually his moment of defeat. What he thought was his moment of victory was his moment of defeat. But he wouldn't even know until three days later. When the Marys <laughs> ran the tomb, <laughs> preparing to go in and, and do things to the body that, that it was traditional to do, and that rock started trembling. And it moved away, and the Roman soldiers ran away, and the angels came down and said, Why are you looking for the living among the dead? That was the pinnacle of God's salvation plan for us. And then at Pentecost, you now put out this Holy Spirit. To come upon the world, to come upon the believers, those who would receive Jesus. That was, that was the pinnacle of the plan. And the final chapter of the action story is when we as believers, when we as believers receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's where the plan, the plan doesn't really end. I can't even say that it ends there. But the script flips. The script flips. Because we over here we were in condemnation. But then we received Jesus as Lord and Savior. We were the hopeless. But when Jesus, we received Jesus as Lord and Savior, the script flipped. Now we have hope. Now we have hope. Now we have a reason to praise, to be to be joyful, to worship that one true living God. That from the beginning, that from the from the from the from the Garden of Eden, from Adam taking of that fruit, through Jesus dying on the cross, to God blowing out the Holy Spirit upon the believers. Now, 
Now the final chapter has begun. If you're a believer, you're in the final chapter of the salvation story. The salvation story. And I got a spoiler alert for you. The end of the book is that we win. That we win. Yes, yes, yes. That we win. Because the veil was rent. We win. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert, and that's guaranteed, and that's promised. There's an enemy out there, but he's a defeated enemy. His, 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 his defeat is certain. His defeat is certain. Just like in the NBA this year. <laughs> to go back to the sports, amen? <laughs> yeah. The Oklahoma City Thunder had the MVP of the league on their team. But they lost. But they lost. Best, best player in the league, you know, by, by all the votes. Kevin Durant. And he's a really good player. You know what? If you got him on your team, I'll, you know you can have a certain amount of confidence that you might got a chance at, at winning the championship. But they lost. They lost. Miami Heat. LeBron James is the best player on the planet right now. Not ever. I have a different opinion on that. He's the best player on the planet right now. But he couldn't bring home a victory. He couldn't bring home a victory. Spurs, they won it all. They won it all without a quote unquote superstar. Their MVP of the finals was somebody who's not even in their big three. Like Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Ginobili! I just like saying that. <laughs> and Tony Parker. Those are the big three. But the MVP, the guy that really was, was critical to them winning was Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard, the young guy. The spark, the spark. But see, then there were other people that came off the bench. Well, Ginobili came off the bench. Ginobili! I'm going to keep saying that. But he came off the bench. He was, he's not a starter. And the team, the team was able to win. See, we got an enemy that's against us. He's got prisoners of war that he uses to try to come at us. But you know what? We got our own big three. We got our own big three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're coming off the bench. We're Kawhi Leonard. We're Kawhi Leonard. Because the big three does what they do. They 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 had they had to pay such attention to the big three. Kawhi Leonard now he's coming up and he's just destroying them. <laughs> Patty Mills coming off the bench. Doing stuff that they didn't think he was gonna do. Shoot, shoot, coming off. Just all these people stepping up. See? That's why. That's why. We stand on the side of victory. Amen. We stand on the side of victory. We up. We up. We are on God's side. He's on our side. Yeah. Amen. Amen. If God be for us, who can be against us? But the veil had to be rent, given us access. But we have to step in and request that access. We have to buy the ticket, if you will. But we can't buy it with money. Can't buy it with coupons. Can't buy it with the old gas station green stamps. Amen. I don't care how many you've got. Sorry for you. But I got seven bucks of these things. I've been collecting for two years. So what? Sorry for you. Sorry for you. There's only one way in. Jesus and I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man coming from to the Father but by me. God is not stupid. God is not wasteful. God would not send down his own uniquely begotten son to die on the cross and go through all those things just to have him be one of the options to get to heaven. That would be ludicrous. That would be ludicrous. I don't want to serve that God that's wasteful. I don't want to serve that God. But I'm thankful that the God I do serve 
is exclusive like that. If that's what you want to call it. Because it requires something of us. It requires a level of dedication. It requires a level of commitment on our part. It requires a lot of submission. It requires humility. But it requires confidence in him. But we get, we, we get back so much more in return for what it quote unquote costs us. Because all we have to do is say yes. Yes, I've sinned before you, Lord. Yes, I know Jesus died for my sins. Yes, I will take him in as Lord and Savior of my life. No me now. Because it won't come. A yes to the Lord. Three yeses. One yes to the Lord. That's what it takes. What do you get for that yes? Behind curtain number one, you get peace. Yes. <laughs> Behind curtain number two, you get joy. Yes. Behind curtain number three, I don't even want to say curtain number three, salvation. Behind curtain number four, you get hope. We're going to need more curtains. <laughs> because a peace that passes all understanding. A God that is able to see us through every situation and storm through every situation not around not around but through because he's able and see on the other side of every through is strength for us we're stronger on the other side when God pushes us through we're stronger on the other side you don't get strong without working out your muscles don't get big your cardio is not improved unless you work out and you got to push yourself when you work out. You can't stroll through the park lollygagging on a Sunday thinking, oh, the cardio is kicking now. Because it's not. Because it's not. We want to do the easy things to get the hard reward. We want to do the easy thing to get the hard reward. We, as believers... As Christians, that is how we try to do God. We try to do God. Well, Lord, you said, I, I did the minimum. I did what you said to do, God. So, so you sliding your ticket on the counter want, wanting the big match return. Okay, what does that equal to? You go to Chuck E. Cheese, you playing skee ball, boom, 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 like five tickets come out, but you want the big stuffed animal that's on the wall. What's that person going to tell you? Yeah. Back it up. You can have something off this front row. It's a little keychain hook, a pencil, one of them old pencil sharpeners, or this whistle. You can have all of that. That's what you worked for. Tootsie Roll. You can have a Tootsie Roll. It ain't even fresh. I don't, it, we got these when we open the building. Glory. Back in 91. It's still good though. Go ahead. That's what your five tickets will get you. But that person who's been there and they're collecting their tickets, they get they get 20 today. They come back next week, they still ski balling. I don't even know what the verb is for it, but you ski balling like the crazy. Finally, you done gathered up four or five hundred tickets. You probably go in there and get whatever you want off that wall. You put in the time. You've put in the time. You've put in the effort. You no, know, if you get to that zero in the middle, you get more tickets. Faster. Foo, foo, foo. If you get your skill down to where you just nailing it every time, foo, 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 foo. And it's going in, that's more tickets faster. If you're not so accurate, it rolls down to that bottom hole, and fewer tickets come out when you get that, but you're still putting in time. <laughs> it might take you a little longer, but you can get to that same amount of tickets that this person is getting. But you got to put in the time. You got to put in the time. So when you cash in them tickets, you can get whatever you want up there. I'll take that big old, big old bear. I want the bear. I want the bicycle. I want the VCR. The, not the VCR. Y'all don't know about that. <laughs> Give me the DVD. The Blu-ray player. I'll take all of that. Hey, man. You got five tickets left. You want this Tootsie Roll? No. No. You, you put it back on him that time. But that's the way it is in the kingdom. That's the way it is in the kingdom. We're not earning anything, but we're building muscle. 
to build in spiritual muscle. And God lets us go through things. When he lets us go through things, we're lifting them heavy weights, but he's our spotter. He's the one to make sure that weight doesn't come crashing down on us and does us more harm than good. He's that spotter. He's, when we're running uphill, he's that breeze that blows behind us to cool us off. Amen. When we're running downhill, he's the one that's in front of us making sure we don't go too fast. So we trip and fall and skin ourselves up. And it hurts and we get deterred from running again. He's that. He's with us every step of the way. He's that one. When we, when we stop, he's that one that says, come on, let's keep going. He's that one that lets us keep going. If you think I'm just making all of this up, read the 23rd Psalm. Read the 23rd Psalm. You're going to know that God is with us every step of the way. That in this spiritual workout, he's pushing us. He's motivating us. He's calling us. He's yelling at us. He's giving us our time of rest. He's giving us our time to partake of the, the still restful waters. He's, he's giving us all of that. But we got to have access. we got to have access. We have to receive that access. It doesn't just come to me. You open the envelope. You've already been approved for a $5,000 credit card. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't take what the enemy is offering you. Don't take what it's hallelujah. Don't do it. Because that's what the enemy is offering. That's what the enemy is offering. We want what God has to offer. Because it's full of guarantees. It's full of lifetime guarantees. It's full of promises. It's full of hope. It's full of joy. It's full of peace. It's full of righteousness. It's full of our own good. We know for a fact that if we would accept the access to Jesus, to God through Jesus, that God has already told us, I know the thoughts I have for you. I know the thoughts I have for you. If God is smart enough to put a salvation plan from Adam all the way to the impartation of the Holy Spirit, and he tells me that I know the plans I have for me, that he had tells me that, I know I must be in pretty good shape. Because I know what my track record is. Gerbils. That's my track record. God's track record is the salvation plan. Amen. Do you want gerbils or do you want the salvation plan? Amen. Amen. When you buy a product at the store, they offer you the, the warranty plan. And you be thinking, well, how much more does it cost? <laughs> that, that, that's what you think. Amen. Don't front. Amen. Don't front, because you're going to ask. Right. Better yet, I, uh, my question is, is it free? That's the first question. Is it free? You are you offering, is it free? But see, God's guarantee comes in the package. When you receive Jesus, you receive a lifetime guarantee. You receive a lifetime warranty. <laughs> All parts can be replaced for free. Amen. <laughs> you, your, your old model gets renewed. <laughs> you, you lose what's, what's all old. You die to all that old. And you get remade anew. You go from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. With so much more capabilities. So much more attractive. Nobody sees a butterfly and is like, Ew, I want to run out over with my car. <laughs> You see a caterpillar, that's the first thing you think. Mm -hmm. Why you want to kill it with your car? That's a bit older. Amen. You need to step on it or whatever or spot it out somewhere. You want to get a car and kill a little caterpillar. But you go from being a caterpillar that people want to drive over with their car to a butterfly. It was beautiful. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Woo, goodness. Bless the Lord. <laughs> so remember, remember when the bell was rang, we gained access. We need an opportunity for access. But in order to have access, you have to have the ticket to Jesus. Amen. 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 Give God some praise today.